today I am delighted to be talking to Dr. Sharon Blackie. Sharon is an award-winning writer, psychologist and mythologist and her highly acclaimed books, courses, lectures and workshops focus are focused on the development of the mythic imagination and on the relevance of myths, fairy tales and folk traditions to the personal, cultural and environmental problems we face today. So as well as writing five books of fiction and non-fiction, including the best-selling If Women Rose Rooted, Sharon, your most recent book, which came out at the beginning of September, is Hagitude, Reimagining the Second Half of Life. And really, this is just perfect for our conversation today about the power of menopause and how it, you know, it sort of plays out now in the second half of our lives. And um, I am actually would like to begin with your book, and I'm imagining this book was partly inspired by your menopause experience. And um, I'd be curious to hear if it was in some ways arising out of that. Uh, it was, and thank you for the invitation, Alexandra, by the way, it's mm. To talk to you again. Um, it was kind of, but it was a little way past um the actual process of menopause when it began. So right. I, I went into menopause at 50 rather abruptly. And um I began writing this book, I suppose, when I was about 57. So it came out of that, you know, quite a long process of going through menopause and then a little bit post-menopause, if one ever is kind of you know, <laughs> ever completely through it. I'm not quite convinced yet. Um <laughs> And but yes, very much about the power of menopause for me and what it revealed and what it what it burnt away, I suppose. Yes, that that's where Haggitude really came from. Mm, what it revealed and what it burnt away. Let's begin with I'd love to unpack I'd like to unpack both those actually in some ways. Um um, when I hear what it revealed to you, was that yes? Would you respond to that? What it what it showed you? Well, I suppose the revelation w was a consequence of the burning away, and and I guess with the benefit of hindsight, and and to some extent, while I was going through it, I thought of menopause as a kind of our chemical process. Mm. So you know, I had. Um, I felt like I was walking fire for most of my menopause, both psychologically, you know, the rage that I had never been allowed to express as a child all came pouring out, but also physically with the hot flushes. But the imagery that kind of, you know, was in my dream world and that was in my imaginal world was all about fire, you know, volcanoes and women who were kind of walking through the world and everywhere they touched their their feet to the ground, fire erupted. And I was thinking to myself, you know, during menopause, that fire feels out of control, I think, for a lot of women. But then as it started to, the, the kind of, uh, the slight madness um, slight, began to fade, what I felt I was left with was a process of more controlled burning. And so I was looking for images of, you know, what what is this? What What is controlled burning? And I thought, well, alchemy, you know, the crucible um, is the place in the alchemical process where everything that is unnecessary is stripped away and where you're calcinated, where you're, is the word that they used, where you're brought back, you're stripped back to the bone. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that process of menopause and coming out of menopause was in an imaginal and very elemental way, a process of getting that fire, an element with which I had always been very uncomfortable under control um, so that it was a, a kind of life enhancing fire rather than a kind of, you know, conflagration that burnt everything in its way, if, if that makes sense. It makes a hundred percent sense to me. And um, I, this is the thing I hear over and over again from uh, women, people going through menopause is rage is the dominant thing. This burning up, this unbelievable, uncontrollable outrage. Yeah. 
it is outrage, isn't it? Rather yes. than kind of anger, you know. Yes, it is outrage. Mm. Yes, it is an outrage. I mean, yes, we can be angry and so sort of shitty and so on, but there, I, I, I think of it as an indignation of soul that our mm. souls have been insulted. There's just this recognition of the insults we've had to bear. It's a lovely it's, way of putting it. At a profound level, and it is both for me, I think of it as personal, but also I feel as though the world is speaking to us in this moment because we, we're channels, we, we become so permeable to something bigger. Right. So the rage is so much bigger than any personal kind of gripes and, you know, slights and whatevers that we have gone through in our lives. And it's just so powerful hearing you speak of this, of walking the fire. Mm-hmm. And um, I think of the discipline that's required not to, to be able to walk through that fire without burning up yourself, or we talk about burning the house. You know, there's a moment where you could torch the lot of it <laughs> yeah, and walk away. It's hilarious, the oh. stories I hear. <laughs> And you speak of, yes, coming into a more controlled burning. And I'm really curious about how you navigated that intense rage uh, so that it could work you alchemically rather than destroying you. Because that's the line we're working, I think, isn't it? I think I think it is. And, um, you know, my immediate reaction to all that was horror, because as a child, I was told that anger was very bad. And as I said, you know, if I look at the elements, I'm much more of a water person, an earth person, even an air person sometimes. But fire is just one of those things that was just no, 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 I don't do fire as an, as an <laughs> elementary experience. It's very frightening to me. So I was very much aware early on, I suppose, because, you know, as a teacher of the mythic imagination, I do think of the word in, world in kind of archetypal and imaginal ways of, of trying to trying to let images arise for what was going on. And really, I think the the archetypal image that came to me um, quite early on was that of the alchemist. Now, you know, we, we, alchemists are usually portrayed, um, particularly medieval alchemists, as kind of, you know, big bearded old men in um, um, laboratories bending over all kinds of arcane contraptions and looking very, very serious. But actually, Um, some of the first very serious alchemists were women, you know, so we have um, Cleopatra, the alchemist, who actually Mm -hmm. was the mother of modern chemistry. And and her, um, the person who mentored her, Maria the Jewess, as she is known, female alchemists who were very, very strong um, at the time, particularly in Alexandria, around about the third and fourth centuries. And so I had this image rather than of the kind of, you know, bulky, medieval, bearded, serious man of rather more, um, rather more serious, middle-aged, menopausal, even women working in a laboratory, working with a crucible, working with that idea of stripping back to the bone and, you know, kind of leaving the ashes, letting everything that is unnecessary strip away so that you find the essence of yourself, you find the core of yourself left behind. So those women alchemists were a real inspiration to me. And then it's a question, or it became a question, excuse me, for me of, of saying, okay, well, you know, I could see what was stripped away, the things I just didn't care about anymore, the things that I, you know, lost, um, as we all do <laughs> during menopause. Uh, but then, okay, what what was left behind? And so it was a years long interrogation, um, I think, of that question. And I'm not entirely sure it stopped yet, but that process mm-hmm. of interrogation, what what was this about? Really, was what led to writing Haggitude because what I wanted to know then was, uh, you know, after menopause, what what then. Uh, we don't end at menopause. We have we've got this transformation. We've got this alchemical um, stripping away. What do we do with it when we when we come through menopause? That's a terrific question, actually, Sharon. I'd love to kind of live into that for a moment with you. What do we do with it? Because I'm loving this image, and this is uh, this was absolutely my experience too of this stripping away of what was not me to come to uh, the absolute essence. And um, and I just want to acknowledge what you sh- just shared about the female alchemists. And I felt quite touched hearing that. And I could imagine that being, I could almost 
imagine it for myself and, you know, feeling into those figures. And it brought this um, a kind of warmth and a fortitude in me, just feeling it in the moment. When you, I just, it's so beautiful that you shared that, actually. Um, it's fantastic. But so I'm imagining you that you I'm imagining you imagined these figures almost dreamt into them a bit and um, that they somehow held you in the fire so you did not destroy yourself. Yeah. That they brought a kind of dignity to your experience. Yes. As, and, as, and, and, as and brought as well. a purpose, so a purposefulness. Yeah. Yes, yes, you could feel the purpose in what was happening. I mean, that's that's the gift, isn't it? Feeling the purposefulness mm -hmm. in what was happening. Mm -hmm. And then, let's just follow this line and this whole thing of reimagining the second half of the life. What's this power about? What's it serving? Yeah, well, you know, in Hecatude, I talk about various other kind of archetypal women out of yes. European myth and folklore that can act as kind of inspirations for what we might become as elders. You know, everything from the fairy godmother, who is the classic kindly mentor, um, mm. through to the more dangerous Baba Yaga kind of characters, the wise women, the seers, and so on. But there is another um archetype of menopause that that perhaps i think gives us a clue as to what the second half of life is for and that is um it's actually a, an archetypal an archetype who was named by a woman called tony wolf who was carl jung's lover and um student um the way it went and uh, she identified what she thought were four really serious and, and uh, important archetypes of, of womanhood. One was the mother, obviously. One was the Amazon, you know, the kind of warrior woman. The yeah. other was the Hatira, um, a Greek word for effectively muse um, to somebody else. So all of the you know, those three archetypes are very much about that. You see them in relation to somebody else. You know, um, the the person that you're amused for, the 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 mother, the person that you're fighting on behalf of. But the fourth was a um, an archetype that she called the medial woman, and this is the only archetype that is not defined by anybody else uh, in relationship to anybody else. The medial woman really is someone who is turning inside to find the source of her own wisdom. Mm. Um, she is kind of a mystic, although mystic is is not all that she is, and. Um, you know, we can find various examples of her from the witch to, you know, real life people, real life mystics like Hildegard of Bingen, you know, that all kinds of women fall into this category of the medial woman. But the point of the medial woman really is that she is looking for insight into what she is for, what she is here for, what her particular gift is that she brings to the world um, at this time. And I know that the concept of calling is also something that, that you have worked with and I have very, very intensively. And so it seems to me that that archetype, the medial woman, you know, in whatever guise you prefer to see her mm. as a kind of priestess or a witch or, or you know, whatever, mm. um, is kind of beckoning us into an exploration of what our gift is, because I think that's what's left when all of that stuff is burnt away mm. in the, the essence of who we are. The, the gift that we bring, you know, in whatever form it might be, that is what the second half of life is for, it seems to me. That has been revealed to us. That's the revelation bit um, of menopause. And now it's a question of, okay, how are we going to go out there in the second half of our lives and put that gift to good use? And there are many ways, you know, everybody is different. Yes, that's actually really crucial to emphasise. Yes, we do use this word calling um, in our work and I, I think of the calling as, you know, traveling with us right from the beginning of our lives. And it, it can make it showings all the way through. But menopause is such an archetypal moment where we are, you know, almost taken by the scruff of our neck and shaken and go, you know, you are really going to face now. <laughs> you have a something. You have a something, a genius, a particular something, a gift. And uh, now you, you must wake up to that and claim that. And then, as you say, the question then is, how am I going to um, realise that in the world? I've, I've had the revelation and now the work of my second half of my life is making that, is, is giving that, is revealing, doing the work of that in the world. 
Indeed, because I think what menopause has done in that in that alchemical um, process is stripped away all of the clutter that gets in the way of it. You know, all of the things that quite quite reasonably, you know, we want to do in the first half of our lives if we have yes. kids, for those of us who, who do, if we have, you know, careers and professions and all of the rest of it, for those of us who think that's important. I mean, that's a building stage, isn't it? Where, as you it's quite rightly say, stage. Yeah. you're calling your calling is always calling you, whether you're actually following down that path or not. But I think menopause offers us a real choice point. Um, you know, James Hillman, um, archetypal de- depth psychologist, who is one of my kind of professional heroes, had this idea about calling that um, most people don't go straight for a path through life that is aligned with their calling. But you're constantly faced with choice points. You know, the world is constantly trying to align you with your calling and offering you ways onto that track. Uh, and it never gives up on you. But nevertheless, it does seem to me that menopause is maybe not a last ditch attempt, but the, but the point at which you, if you really go for it and allow that process of transformation to happen, which of course our culture doesn't help us to do, but if you manage that, then, you know, you really are at a very rich and potentially powerful stage of your life where you can you can make a difference in all kinds of different ways depending on who you are and the nature of that gift yes yes uh, i'm loving what you're saying i love james hillman's work um he, he's been someone i've sort of traveled with so to speak in inverted commas um over the years and i love this image of how uh, the, the the calling is sort of courting us through our lives and we are given these choice moments and th- what you said there about it not giving up on us is just such a beautiful statement that yeah it just that touches me a lot and, and i partly because that's what I felt. I felt this. I actually did feel this thing there inside me, which I had no language for or anything. But there was something there. And I, it's interesting to look back on one's life. You know, now I look back on my life and I can see, oh, yeah, I, I, wow. You can see the orchestration that was going on, you know, in all the apparent arbitrariness of one, my life. There was, I could see now the orchestration at work right. that allowed this to come through. And that's one of the wonders of getting older is being able to look back because when you're in it, it just feels, well, <laughs> you know, you don't have that. Yes, yeah. chaotic, yeah. But in a way, if, if I was talking now to a younger person, I would say keep, keep trust the mystery of your life, even though on the surface it's, it's not looking pretty or attractive. Mm-hmm. Trust the mystery. There is something there. And keep coming back to your own goodness because mm-hmm. that'll, that'll um, kind of guide you. Yes. Indeed. And I think, you know, for, for a, lot of, a lot of people that, that I've spoken to as well, who find menopause incredibly challenging. And of course it can be, you know, for everybody. I mean, in in some ways I had an easier time of it than many because it came as a result of um, coming abruptly off the pill, which I had been using to control endometriosis and kind of, you know, half of the the stuff, the difficult stuff of menopause had happened in the background, the the difficult physical stuff while I was still on the pill. So I wasn't aware of it, but the, the psychological um, transformations nevertheless were 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 fairly kind of earth <laughs> shattering but I think if we can try to get through to people who are in that very very difficult phase and mm. you know wondering what it's all for are they going mad is you know is this really the end of everything to just say no you just you just have to at certain points in your life sit through really difficult stuff and there is a point because it does this for you. And here are some stories of women, you know, for whom it has done that. And that's, I yes. think, so powerful. And we're not really getting those stories, are we, in, in popular culture? We're getting stories yeah. about, you know, looking beautiful forever if you take HRT and all of that kind of nonsense. And it's not what it's for. No, no, no. It's the waste of so much because that of so much power that is 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 hungry for something it, it's you know that menopause really in to my mind really unleashes something yes. and you know ready or not that power is there and if you're not kind of with yourself then that power i think can become i want to say destructive but disturbing or mm-hmm. you i think you disturb people around you actually because yeah. there's a lack of congruence mm-hmm. And um, I feel this quite strongly, actually, uh, when I see some, you know, quite a lot of older women, particularly, and and I can see 
this power in them that's not going to be silenced anymore. But because they're sort of a bit struggling with life with themselves and haven't been resourced and supported enough, you know, to come into something deeper within themselves, I see them being dismissed and treated as ridiculous or, um, you know, diminished or a bit mad in some way. And I find I just that both brings me to tears and enrages me, actually. I feel very, very protective. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so we're saying very strongly, you know, the power is there, ready or not. And menopause is this extraordinary workout. I think of it as this extraordinary workout. Um, to come into this, and, and you've said the same sort of thing, of coming into this al alignment, a real true alignment with yourself. So you're kind of a clear channel for this power to use you in a way that feels more congruent. I mean, it's demanding. It demands things of me. It demands a degree of also responsibility and wakefulness, you know, attention um, to it. Um, but I love now when I reflect back, you know, it's 15 years out of menopause, I reflect back and I can really see how menopause uh, sets you up so well if you can if you can meet the challenge that's there. Yes, and I think the meet trick the is, is to, to, to find some way of navigating the cultural urgencies you know that tell us that we still have to be all things to all people because we we are not allowed the space I mean again I was very fortunate because although I was incredibly busy and and constantly um you know took it took on more than than I ought to do I nevertheless was working from home and so if I wasn't having a good day um you know in capital letters <laughs> <laughs> uh, and at least I wasn't having to go and inflict it on other people in a workplace. So, you know, that gives you a little bit more flexibility to mm. manage it. And of course, a lot of people don't have that, which I think is yeah. one of the reasons why everybody gets in such an unholy mess. But again, to me, that is part of education uh, mm. so that women recognize not only what's happening to them, but what they need to navigate it. And I think for, for me, that that whole process that I've spoken about, you know, of the, the kind of burning away, the, the leaving behind the essence when you get through the slightly challenging first few years does leave you if you've done a little bit of work, of work around your calling and, and kind of in, you know interrogated that question of what, what is it this essence that is left it leaves you with a laser sharp focus doesn't it i mean i think that that the, the clutter is just incomprehensible anymore right. you know and, and and i i know women who who have seen that happen to them but have but have set, have, have referred to it as a, a kind of like a some kind of cognitive failure it's just like you know i can't multitask anymore and i keep thinking to myself no you're being told <laughs> not to multitask anymore because <laughs> you, know, you need to focus in and i have become um you know brutal about turning down things that don't fit with this particular path that has emerged out of that menopausal burning away and, and the sense of calling which I have it's just like no what was I doing all those years saying yes to this and this and this it's like this is what I have to do and it's lovely you know and that's what I'd love also to, to help people understand that it is beautiful to be we all have bad days clearly but it is beautiful to have that sense of focus and clarity finally in Finally, I'm absolutely loving what you're saying here. This uncompromising, laser sharp focus. Right. It's extraordinary. Yes, it's it just is. extraordinary. And just and then, insisting in, on what's necessary. And when I spoke to uh, your colleague, Sophie, who first invited me to this lovely um, conversation with you, she said, you know, there's something I'm, I'm telling tales on her now. She said, there's something about Alexandra that I really like. So, you know, when she gets to a certain point in the day, it's like she just switches off. You know, she's just not going to go late. And I said, yes, that's me, too. I refuse to do a Zoom call that doesn't end by 4 p.m., you know, unless the world is going to end if I don't. And it's just like, no. You know, and and I couldn't have possibly done that ten years ago. I'd have been ridden. I'd have been up at midnight if it made it easier for other people. But it's just like no, because if I do that, you know, my whole pattern will be messed up, and I won't be able to do my work in the world. And that that isn't as selfish as it sounds, is it? Is it? It's just part of that kind of. This is who I am. This is the way it works for me. And it's this is my lane. This is what I can do 
really, really well for the world. And don't ask me to do other people can do those other pieces much better than me. I I am absolutely serving my my lane. And I'm I'm absolutely taking care of myself. You know, that point at five in the in the end at the end of the day, five o'clock, I'm out of there. It's God, like I'm, I'm still pump, pumpkin hour, pumpkin hour, I'm out of here. <laughs> Yeah. It's so hilarious. <laughs> um, now I've distracted myself from not what I'm saying. <laughs> My capacity for doing that is amazing. Um, Having tales yeah. out of school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, staying. It is this self. It is utterly about self interest. It's serving myself because I do not want to feel unwell. I do not want my nervous system to be overstretched because I do not want to feel crappy. I love feeling well. And the beauty of feeling well is that I can just, I've got so much to offer. I've got so much creativity. There's so much. And I I imagine that you're the same, that you're not short of creative, you know, ideas coming through you, that they'll probably stack that behind ready to come through and um and and these are things you know i've got this going on and these are things that i am really this is my lane this is what i'm really good at and i want to be able to share it this is my piece to share with the world and so i don't want to scatter my energy on things that aren't my thing right. so yes and i think that there's also a recognition certainly for me anyway of, of what shifts over time so i guess i've always had a a kind of tension um, in my life between, you know, the hermit in me, the old woman who would like to live in the woods and, you know, yes, yes. be found by by one Vasilisa a year um, and <laughs> write books, you know, which is a very inward kind of quiet process with, you know, all the curtains closed and the fire lit and kind of mysterious. And the part of me that knows that also I have a gift for certain types of talking and teaching, but mm-hmm. finds that visibility much less comfortable. I don't like it. It it, And I find it incredibly draining, incredibly draining and always have. But I've always had this kind of tension and guilt, you know, oh, I need to be out there doing more teaching because I don't know, just because. Um, and the older I get, the more I find that I can't do that. Mm. Um, it's as if, you know, it's as if the process is kind of taking over for me. Um, I find it even more tiring. I find it even more draining. So I do very little of that. And what I really, really need to focus on increasingly, I'm very much aware is writing books. You know, you reach a lot of people through books. So I think it's also just having an attitude that rather than leaping to conclusions about what you must be in the world that just sits back and also listens to your body. Because for me, that was a very physical understanding as much as anything else. It's just like, I'm physically exhausted if I do this kind of thing. And I don't want to be, you know, I had a a long illness last year as well, which made me very, very much aware of that. And so I think it is post-menopause when your body has gone through a vast transformation as well as your sort of psychological and spiritual transformation. Mm. the need to actually listen to what it is now because it ain't what it was <laughs> no, no. No, no. <laughs> to listen to what it needs now which may have changed considerably over that process and again we're not used to doing that much are we so uh, it's very much an embodied way of learning for me um you're just that kind of sniffing which I wasn't always very good at when I was younger you know just that kind of sniffing out what what literally feels good and when you get the lump in your throat when you wish you hadn't said yes to something and you know that bodily awareness to me is very much part of navigating through menopause and beyond Mm, mm, mm. Uh, I'm uh, I'm just really uh loving this image of you um you know just uh wanting to be that hermit more and more writing books and only one Vasilisa a year. So, <laughs> world, have you heard? Heard? Only one at a time, one a year. <laughs> That's all you get. <laughs> That's all you get from me. <laughs> oh, gosh. There's so much to pick up on. And I'm, so I want to just track back a little bit, just in the little bit of time we've got left, I just because I want to capture something that you said before that I think is really important for people that are in the heat of menopause. You, you named this whole thing about cultural urgencies mm-hmm. and that, and the fact, of course, that we don't really value what's going on at menopause. So, of course, we're not supported. And... Um, 
That is the thing I really want to name very, very strongly for everyone listening is to get as much support as you can so that you can have some space and time for yourself because that's where the alchemy can actually really, really work. If we're trying to uh, be out in the world doing the, you know, the same as usual, that alchemical process is just, it's going to drive us mad. It's, yeah, we are going to burn the house down. Um, so I'm just wanting to really name the uh, crucialness of um, getting as much support as you can and on all sorts of levels, actually, uh, yeah, it's allowing the, the space. I mean, the, the way that I describe it in Haggitude is is very much as a, a you know a time between stories, a, 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 because you've left the old story behind. Yes, who you thought you were and who the culture wanted you to be, but yeah. you haven't yet grown into exactly. a sense of what the new story is. So it's that it is that pause. It's it's more than just a pause in the menses, isn't it? It's a pause in life. I think where you know we. See it with the uncertainty and our ancestors you know our old stories in in Britain and Ireland show us very clearly that our ancestors had no problem with uncertainty uh you know but we are taught that it's bad that something terrible might happen if we allow it and I think that ability to just recognize this is a process which is going to happen and it's going to shake everything that you ever thought you know about yourself and about who you were and what you should be upside down and that that's okay that that is supposed to happen if people exactly. knew that, I think we'd have a lot less panic and there is a lot of panic I don't mean that in a, in a negative way no there is yes yeah. because uh, just because of, of what you said that we are so as a culture we don't deal with uncertainty with the unknown well and I I would love to give the message to people listening that actually that uncertainty is an invitation into the possibility, because I think of the unknown as um, a great fullness, the, 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 the plenum where there's, there's so much possibility that could come through. And um, so, yes, as you said, you're stepping out of a story and the new story of your life hasn't emerged yet. And, but your new story is present in this unknown space. And initially, it's unnerving because we're not used to <laughs> not knowing the ground. But if you can slow down, because this is the crucial element, is really being able to slow down so you can sort of catch yourself again and go, oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, the ground is not steady right now. Okay, so just come back to myself, who am I? Let's just sit down here for a moment. As you start to take those kind of very literal steps of just slow, literally and sitting, but also sort of metaphorically inside your psyche, slowing everything down, slowing your nervous system down, as the more you start to do that, one, I think you'll encounter a, a quietness a, a, which will bring a herald, a kind of peace. As long as that you know the basics of life are being cared for. You know, you've got, you can put food on the table, roof over the head, that sort of thing. Right. Then th 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 there can come that sort of calm, shall we say. And then that, for me, is you're creating this fertile soil in which the new story can be known indeed it can start to show itself yeah indeed i think you're absolutely right and i also think that um it's very much a time for looking back as well uh, not obsessively but looking back over the story so far and particularly thinking about the cultural mythology that you have been living by, you know, recognizing. Yes. I think we do that often for the first time. Some people earlier, yeah. um, uh, but a lot of people do that for the first time, really, I think during menopause, don't they? When, they? when they have that period where everything is just seems to be shattering, where you look back at all of the things the culture has told you that you must be as a woman, mm. um, and particularly as an aging woman, and you start to do what I always call falling out of the cultural mythology, you fall out of myth, and yes. then you're in that place between stories. It's like, you know, then yeah. what is yeah. the myth that you're going to live by? So it is, I think you get that period of 
kind of hiatus of calm and quiet that you're so beautifully describing. But then there's that work of of kind of reconstruction, of remembering, if you like, depending on what metaphor you, you want to use for it, where you're actually beginning to construct a new story. Uh, one of the archetypes, just as a, an aside, that I particularly love um, about uh, in the elder uh, woman category, having come through menopause, is, is the archetype of the trickster and the truth teller. Um, because you know they are characters who the trickster is is as you are aware archetypically a disruptor character who sees that something in the cultural story or the individual story is broken um, and rather than allowing it to limp on goes in there and breaks it a little bit better um, <laughs> I like that breaks it a bit better <laughs> it's like a, an act of destruction but actually isn't it's a very necessary breaking often so the trickster and I think a lot of women come out of menopause being able to do that you know to see just where mm-hmm. it needs to be shaken up not in, not in a hugely destructive burning the house down way but but in a in a way that just mirrors holds up a mirror i mean good trickster holds up a mirror to the culture and to the individual and says look you know this is what you actually are and then the truth teller who without rage but with that element of kind of righteous wrath or outrage perhaps that, that as you were talking about it earlier on is able to kind of call out aspects of the culture which are really dysfunctional so that process in menopause of reflection and looking at the cultural mythology in a way that has to happen first you've got to sort of clear the ground really uh for the new story to emerge and so and i think a lot of the rage arises out of seeing how Mm. i i I talk about being conned yeah i I thought oh oh how did i how did i get conned by that Mm. it's so silly that i expended so much energy you know trying to maintain that fiction it was a total con yeah and i think you know the 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 clarity that the mental clarity that comes with menopause or out of menopause for a lot of people is it is hormonal you know i mean it it is also there at a physical level as well as a a spiritual level i mean hormones mess you up you know they they (laughs) they, uh, hormones impinge on your emotions and i remember the, the the thing that that i found most remarkable which is that sense of oh my god all of those years you know I was constantly in these monthly swings of you know cycles of emotion which of course is a necessary and and, um, important part of the menstrual cycle but nevertheless once you're freed of that it's just remarkable and very very wonderful Uh, so again I always want to tell women that there is this to look forward to you know you do have most women who who are able to who you know who have been able to unclutter a little bit report that sense of intense clarity, mm. uh, d- different from focus, just clarity in their in their thinking. And I never, I think, had any of the brain fog, you know, that a lot of people report as a yeah. I didn't either. I mean, it was just yeah. that sense of clarity. I didn't again. Yeah. I didn't quite know what to do with it. It wanted to run away with me, but mm. um, but it was very beautiful, and I wanted yeah. that. I wanted to hold on to that. Mm. Mm. It was something that I could see that was the, the jewel at the end of the the, the quest. Mm. Yes, I, I, I'm with you on that clarity. It was fierce, actually, clear the way through for me. And I think of those menstruating years, um, of course, you suffered, which is, you know, messes everything up. But I actually think of the, you know, this is what we teach in our work, that um, the work of menstrual cycle awareness is learning is this, is an alchemical process. The menstrual cycle journey each month is a kind of alchemical process that you go through. And in a way, you're building the vessel that allows you to meet the great uh, uh, initiation of menopause with... um, instead of being slammed by it, it's actually, it feels like an evolutionary step in which you have been, um, you know, educated in something to meet. So there's a much more integrated sense of something unfolding. So there's less energy wastage, I want to say, you know, I mean, if we, if we could restore this whole conversation about, uh, about the menstrual cycle years from monarchy to menopause, 
um, just revision all that, which is of course what's happening now, you know, with our work, our focus at Red School. Um, then the whole thing of menopause would be vastly recontextualized or reframed so that we could really experience um, the sort of essence of what you've been, artic well, both of us have been articulating today. Uh, this, uh, this process would feel a lot more dignifying and, dare I say, even supportive um, if we'd had, you know, the backstory, as we like to say. Indeed, I mean, I wish, I wish I had found you during my menstrual. Yes, I wish body. you had too. I wish you had too. Oh yes, I know. And um, but we're all. I, I think of because what we're right speaking of about menopause. This is, you know, we're we're setting a line now for for generations to come. So, I say we say in our book, you know, if you only experience sort of five percent of what we're talking about, you're ahead. You're ahead. You're, you're good. You're good. You know, and this is, but you're doing it also for generations to come. Yeah. So. Um, Sharon, oh God, I'm just so relishing this conversation with you. Me too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so just really for the last few minutes, I don't know, is there anything more that you want to say? And, and, and actually particularly about the place that you're in now and the things that you are enjoying now about your life as a postmenopause woman, um, anything at all, anything that you'd like to share with people? Kind of. I mean, to, just to just to be difficult, I suppose I'd like to talk about death. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, let's throw death into the pot. <laughs> why do the easy stuff? Um, yeah, no, no, I'm all for death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you look at the journey through the second half of life, which, you know, you can argue begins at menopause, it has this obvious end, you know, the, the kind of... The I've noticed classic. it. I've noticed it. <laughs> exactly. And it's another, as well as menopause, it's another of those cultural taboos. So we're faced with this journey through the second half of life, which can be the most intensely transformative and I think in many ways joyful time of our lives. Definitely uh, joyful. Kind of way. But, you know, it begins with a part of the journey that we're not supposed to talk about, menopause. I mean, women that, that you know, a lot of my... Um, audience I suppose are, are in the, the United States and and it's still one of those words that people just can't say in public and so we can't talk about that which is the beginning of the journey and then we can't talk about the end of the journey which is inevitably death um, and it just seems to me that whenever we are looking at menopause and we look at the journey out of it you know that, that we're able to have those conversations about uh, about um about death and that we look at it I suppose I learned in various ways to look at this journey through the second half of life as making making a friend out of death I think and kind of walking with death because I think you have to I think you have to and it, it happened for me in a, in a in a couple of different ways one is um I, I never had anybody particularly close to me die you know um my mother died last year but before that Really, it was just something I'd never kind of really experienced. And then our much loved sheepdog, who's just like an angel dog. I don't mean that in a kind of fairy, airy, fairy way, but just like she's just something special, um, got lymphoma. And I said to a friend at the time, I really felt, and it was a, a real shock. She was young, quite young at the time. And I said to a friend that it was as if death had walked into my house and sat down uninvited at the table. And then, um, as you are familiar with, um, four or five years on, I myself got lymphoma, exactly the same kind as Nell had had, exactly the same place and exactly the same treatment. And I remembered how I felt, um, you know, when Nell had got lymphoma. And it seemed to me that the challenge for me, and it wasn't actually so much of a challenge after all, was as I kind of describe it in Haggitude, that that it that you welcome you have to learn to welcome death as a guest at your table and, you know, pour her a very nice glass of red wine or something that you have to not want to die, but you have to walk through the second half of life in awareness of this really powerful, also transformative energy. You know, in all of our ancient mythology, death is transformation, not 
ending. So I think that I would just say that that is a conversation also that I would encourage people to to have and and to think about, you know, how can you befriend death so that when you're walking through this journey towards the inevitable, it's not seen as something to dread, not seen as something necessarily to welcome, but just something that is accepting so that, you know, in the end, you're quite happy to take death by the hand and um, toddle off to wherever it is we go and whatever happens. Thank you so much for that, for naming that, Sharon. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I speak to myself a little bit now about how I feel a little bit organized. I, you know, but I joked, I said it's turned up on the lands, you know, on the horizon in the far distant bit, but be feeling a sort of slightly being organized by death. Um, and I really like this image of you just naming it, acknowledging its presence now at the table. It's at the table. Yeah, there's a lovely, there's a lovely little end of uh, end of a poem that I put right at the end of Hagitude, giving it oh, yes. a little bit. It's only six lines. Can I read it? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And let us finish with that. That would be perfect. Lovely. It's by a, a, an Irish poet, a late late Irish poet, Evan Boland, and she has a wonderful, quite long narrative poem called Anna Liffey, which is about a, a woman's life as a river, effectively the the River Liffey in Dublin. Yes. She says this: the body is a source, nothing more. There is a time for it. There is a certainty about the way it seeks its own dissolution. Consider rivers. They are always en route to their own nothingness. From the first moment, they are going home. That is exquisite. And it's accompanied by the garbage collection. <laughs> Very appropriately. What could be yeah, appropriately? Death has a sense of humour, if not. I know. Yes. <laughs> now that is actually really profound. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Mm, thank you very much, Sharon. It's been a pleasure, I, as always. Yeah, it feels a very complete conversation. Um, that I've had with you, ending, of course, appropriately with death. Yeah, very rich. So thank you very much indeed, Sharon. Thank you, Alexandra. Much, yeah. much appreciated. Yeah.